You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Monday. March 11th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jonathan H. Marks. Director of the Bioethics Program at Penn State University, also an affiliate faculty with Penn State Law and School of International Affairs on the perils of partnership, industry influence, institutional integrity, and public health. Also on the program today, Trump's dom- uh, domestic slashing Pentagon pumping budget will never be law. But it is a nice summation of his and Republican policies. Meanwhile, Tucker Carlson in the barrel and unbowed. Dems will pass legislation in the House to make D.C. the 51st state and send to the Senate where Mitt, uh, I imagine McConnell will shut it down. Do the same thing for Puerto Rico or independence. Okay. I will. Day four of blackouts in Venezuela, if only Puerto Rico had such coverage. Meanwhile, video uh, released debunks the aid convoy story that even our vice president was pushing. Huh. Even Mike Pence? They don't have video in the White House. New reports on a, an imminent North Korea missile launch. So much for all that. And in the guise of over of expanding overtime pay, Trump rolls back Obama's overtime plan, which would have raised overtime or given overtime to 12 million Americans. New releases show Trump's DOJ actually contemplated launching a Uranium One investigation. 157 die in an Ethiopian air crash. But it's Boeing's fault. Piers Boeing has a problem. And the Iowa Supreme Court rules against Iowa's trans people Medicaid ban. Good for that court. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is another week. Uh, we're 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 in March. We it, it is getting. Uh, we're now in um, a spring uh, daylight savings time, and uh, apparently uh, Donald Trump had some comment about it. I don't really care, but I did find it fascinating that Brendan my son does, slept in uh, this morning by about fifteen twenty minutes. Like he like he still. Um, you know, sort of on uh, on the old time. Yeah, I mean, same, same issue. The hour, the, the hour, it killed me this weekend. It was not my two birthday parties. It was that one hour taken away from me. Deadly. He also had a birthday party. Uh, so uh, you guys, you're you're basically living life. Uh, and um, uh, we are now. We are in mid March almost, and we are only uh, about. Three months away from the first Democratic uh, primary debate, maybe a little bit less, actually. So um, this is where we're headed, and um, it it should be interesting. And uh, here is an example of what won't be terribly interesting, although I think maybe this is I, I mean, it is. I, you know, I've said this for some time, but it really is amazing and we're going to have to wait and see, um, you know, what happens. And hopefully uh, after 2020, we'll be able to test this proposition when we have a uh, the Democrats having governmental control of both houses and the uh, presidency. We're not living in an era, I think, where uh, having 
the House and the presidency is necessarily uh, going to help. Um, And we saw this in the last term, I think, of Obama, where at the very least the rhetoric changed in the Senate and in the House caucuses to a certain extent. We saw the expansion of Social Security uh, being voted on in a non-binding resolution, of course. Um, But we saw all the caucus members in the Senate vote to expand Social Security, a dramatic turn from where we were just seven, eight years later, or earlier, I should say. Um, And in the Democratic Party, the rhetoric, at least, like I say, we've yet to see, uh, but, you know, today, maybe I think it's today or tomorrow, we will see the House vote to um, make uh, D.C. the 51st state. Um, The rhetoric has not only um, become more partisan, less uh, deferential by uh, by Democrats, not across the board, but just but broadly. Um, And uh, also uh, to the left, to the extent that the sort of moderate conservative who jumps in the race when he goes on Morning Joe, John Hickenlooper, the uh, the the champion of, of fracking, is afraid to say He's capitalist. Here is uh, John Hickenlooper with Joe Scarborough. This is pretty funny. And it really is getting people together, getting them to lay down their weapons, and then getting stuff done. And the labels, I think most Democrats don't care as much about the labels. Well, would you call yourself would you call yourself a proud capitalist? (laughs) <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, you know, again, the labels, I'm not sure uh, any of them fit. But I do believe that, you know, that ability to look at, you know, climate change and figure out how are we really going to create a sense of urgency and get people together. What we right. did with methane, methane is one of the worst climate pollutants that there is. And, you know, we're the first state and so far the only state to really address it aggressively. Right. Let me ask you just I'll, I'll break it down even more. Do you consider yourself a capitalist. Well, again, the labels, you know, I'm a small business person. So uh, <laughs> that part of the system that you would call capitalist, I get it. I understand it. Uh, what? I worked very hard. You know, when you open your own business, you know, when we first signed the lease in lower downtown Denver to build our brew pub, it was one dollar per square foot per year. I mean, that right. is if you haven't ever signed one of those leases, that is a that rent is almost free. And it reflects how bad and how abandoned that part of the of the community was. We worked right. 70, 80, 90 hours a week wow. to build the business. And we worked with the other business yeah. owners in lower down to help them build their business. Is that capitalism? I guess. I mean, sure. so in that sense of building community, uh, that's one way to do it. One aspect of it. It's not all all that it is, right? I served on 42 right. nonprofit boards and committees in that same 12 year period. Right. Well, so, so uh, uh, do you consider yourself a capitalist and does capitalism <laughs> work? <laughs> well, I think. Pause I, it. Wait a second. It's just like they're both so confused here. They're both like, wait a second, what? He's got to ask this question three times. Like, he's literally getting, like, I, there's no doubt in my mind that the producer's going, wait, Joe, ask him. Why won't he answer that question? That's, the, it's, that's supposed to be the softball question, right? Wait, just go back a little bit. It's so funny because like, it, it really is, it is, it, it, it's almost as if uh, Hickenlooper was just like going like, um, what's the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Just looking at some polling here. What, what is the like? He clearly has seen there has been some internal poll where they basically just said, hey, um, nobody's ever going to ask you this, but just don't say you're a proud capitalist. And then just coincidentally, he gets asked it. And they're both just completely confused as to why they're having this conversation. Continue. Boards and committees in that same 12 year period. Right. Well, so, so uh, uh, do you consider yourself a capitalist and does capitalism work? Well, I think I, I, I don't look at myself with a label. Uh, <laughs> and I certainly think that small business is part of the solution. Uh, I think right now, what? the way capitalism is working in the United States, it's not doing what it once did. It's not, it's really not providing security and opportunity for the middle class and for poor people. 
Wow. I wow. just love that. that. Just... It's just the same disingenuousness. A couple years ago, that guy was talking to a progressive audience, and people were trying to get him to commit to probably even really minimal things because his record as governor of Colorado is quite conservative. And he was probably like, well, you know, if you want to call that progressive, create an opportunity for right, people. Right, exactly. And now he's doing the same hey, nonsense to if, Joe Scarborough's capitalism if, propaganda. If expanding Social Security and providing single-payer health care insurance to every American is capitalism, sure, I'm a capitalist then. If tracking to <laughs> Nicaragua to have solidarity with the Sandinistas makes me a capitalist, then I don't flinch from that label, Joe. If, if listen, if, if nationalizing uh, the refining capacity of the United States as well as the banks is capitalism, then I'm a capitalist, Joe. If, if holding the criminal <laughs> CEOs of fossil fuel companies accountable while nationalizing their assets makes me pro-free market, then, you know, I certainly wouldn't flinch from that label, Joe. I think we need to come together. Common right. sense solutions, um, public private partnerships, re education camps, <laughs> t- teaching people uh, a new set of uh, way of doing things is capitalism. Then shoot fits. Sending Don Jr. to do a little <laughs> bit of manual labor because he's part uh, of the bourgeoisie class that has destroyed not only this plant country but the entire planet makes me a capitalist joe then i then sure i think we get too fixated I, on labels that's just fascinating to me but i mean to, to you know that is just um that is polling that is polling just like internal polling just you know the bones are showing a little bit too much there uh, this does seem like a good chance to put out some sort of psa to define uh, what a capitalist actually is, which is not nearly as subjective as they're making it out to be in this clip, right? Like a capitalist is a boss or a property owner who, uh, you know, makes money off of the working class. So he, he did answer the question, like really, in several different ways when he's like, yes, I, well, I am a small business owner. Like, yes. So, so the answer is yes, you are a capitalist. Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty obvious. Um, I mean, that he is. He's just he won't. He won't. Uh, he's trying to pull to at three percent instead of point five percent. Right. He's got to get into that uh, debate. I, I just love the idea of like within ten seconds of being asked if you're a capitalist, you're talking about controlling methane. <laughs> I was. All, I just so hope that Marianne Williamson and Andrew <laughs> Yang are on that stage and not John Hickenlooper. Uh, Folks, every two seconds, there is a new victim of identity theft, which means a criminal could be spending your money, applying for loans in your name, even damaging your credit, the good credit you've worked so hard to build. Unfortunately, you can miss certain threats to your identity by just checking bank statements and monitoring your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. LifeLock uses proprietary technology to detect and alert you to a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web, for example. And if you do have an issue uh, involving identity theft, one of LifeLock's identity restoration specialists will work to fix it. Of course, no one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But with LifeLock, you get ide- LifeLock, you get identity theft protection and additional features to help protect you, your devices against cyber threats for as low as nine ninety nine a month. I uh, I signed up for some new service at National Grid the other day, or Con Ed. I can't remember which one it was. And I got, I got pinged. They they sent me a text. Just want you to know that somebody's opened up an account in your name. I was like, thank you. It was, it was helpful. Uh, I was impressed by that. Don't waste another second, folks. Visit lifelock.com slash majority now to save 10% on your first year. That's lifelock.com slash majority for 10% off. Lifelock.com slash majority majority also uh folks as you know stress is a worldwide epidemic we're working longer hours we're inundated with the constant news cycle we're more connected than ever before i I feel like that that notion of stress is completely indistinguishable from my life i would say That's why we're partnering with Calm. It's the number one app to help reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. There are more than 40 million people around the world who have downloaded it now. 
If you head to calm.com slash majority, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes guided meditations on issues like anxiety, stress, and focus, including a brand new meditation each day. Sleep stories, which are my, which are, I was going to say my bedtime stories, but they are bedtime stories for adults designed to help you relax. Head to the magical lavender fields of Southern France with Stephen Fry. Oh, no. <laughs> Stop hurting me, Mr. I can Frog. hear about it as long as it's not uh, it's not as like not smell. It's psychosomatic. I can hear about it. Uh, or explore the moonlit jungles of Africa with Leona Lewis. They also Everybody. have soothing music and more. Right now, Majority Report listeners get twenty five percent off a Calm Premium subscription at Calm dot com slash majority. That's Calm C A L M dot com. Slash majority get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today at calm dot com slash majority. Get calm and stop stressing. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Jonathan H. Marks about the perils of partnership, industry influence, institutional integrity, and public health. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Just a reminder, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. You get to hear uh, all the, uh, uh, the extra content in the fun half. In the meantime, I want to welcome to the program the author of The Perils of Partnership, Industry, Influence, Institutional Integrity, and Public Health. He's the director of the Bioethics Program at Penn State University, also affiliate faculty with Penn State Law and School of International Affairs. Jonathan H. Marks, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So um, we're talking specifically about public-private uh, partnerships. Um, we have heard about these, I think, for um, you know quite a while in the context of, uh, you know, uh, I guess may- maybe most often in sort of like localized uh, development, if you will. What, when did... The uh, when did we start to see more of this in the context of public health? So that's a great question. I grew up in Britain, and um, we have Margaret Thatcher to thank for PFIs, as she called them, private finance initiatives, which were in sort of in the infrastructure sector. But um, in recent years, in the last, uh, especially in the last decade or so, there have been a proliferation of public-private partnerships in the context of public health. And usually with corporate actors who are responsible for either creating or exacerbating the very public health problem that the governments are trying to solve. So, for example, partnering with the soda industry to address obesity. Well, uh, let's. I, w- I want to go into uh, some of the, uh, the 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 detail. I mean, some of the specifics. You do a lot of case studies here, um, and. Uh, ultimately, you introduce uh, the um, the principle of uh, of separation of powers in some respects, um, and also, I guess, maybe what we would contemplate in terms of like antitrust on, on some level. But um, let's uh, let's start with with some of the, the you know you mentioned sodas and obesity, but let's let's talk about a couple of the uh, the, the case studies that you talk about. Um, the the idea of uh, the U.S. working with fast food companies um, to increase the amount of cheese that they offer. 
Yeah, so that's a that's a great example. And I do want to come back to the arguments I make about separation of powers yes. and antitrust, because I think the argument I'm making is essentially that whatever your politics, you should care about corporate influence. And I'll come back to that. But the example you give is a is a great one. Um, this is it led to the headline in the New York Times, um, you know, while warning about fat, U.S. pushes cheese sales. So essentially, um, there was a surfeit of cheese in the market, and um, the government basically uh, went to uh, what at that time was the least well-performing pizza chain and said, hey, you're not doing very well. We can help you out. How about um, getting some more cheese into your pizzas? And voila, the stuffed cheese crust pizza was born. Not because Americans were clamoring for it, but because this was a great way of offloading a ton of cheese that was not being sold. Uh, I, I, I'm, that story is just so nuts to me. Uh, but, but, but so, OK, well, first off, let's just back up. What, why was there a, a surplus of cheese? Why is that the business of the United States government? Well, so we have a a U.S. Department of Agriculture that has what is essentially a conflicting mission. So on the one hand, it's trying to promote the interests of agribusiness. On the other hand, it's also in the business of offering um, dietary guidance um, in collaboration with Health and Human Services. And so these two things conflict. Obviously, um, if Americans are paying some attention to the warnings about consuming too much fat and they don't buy cheese, that um, serves the, um, the sort of dietary guidance aim. But uh, agribusiness is obviously upset because it has a ton of cheese it can't shift. And so what um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and this was, um, by the way, under uh, uh, under Obama as well as Bush, what they did was they basically signed off on these collaborative arrangements um, designed to offload a bunch of cheese onto the domestic market. How does the collaboration work? Is it just sort of like we're going to sit in a room with you and we can uh, we're going to bring in some of the greatest thinkers? We're going to come up with a uh, concept where we put cheese into the uh, dough, or is it? I mean, what what does what does the actual collaboration in that context look like? So I, my understanding, just from the documents in the public domain, I mean, I wasn't obviously in the room, is that, yes, it does involve people sitting around um, a boardroom um, and trying to figure this thing out together, public and private. And in fact, um, the the sort of go-between between between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the food companies was Dairy Management Incorporated, which is actually a creature created by federal statute. And it's sort of funded by the dairy checkoff program. So it gets money from agribusiness. And basically what they did is they sat down and worked with these fast food companies. And in fact, they boasted that they had worked with Taco Bell to produce a menu item that contained eight times as much cheese as the average menu item that that fast food company was offering. Um, I mean, that just sounds like... I mean, this is almost the, the the problem is even beyond right the public partner, uh, the the public private partnership, or is it is it because of the 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 relationship from the of the regulatory agency, or I guess I guess that's what you would call it. Um, th- there's just too close of a of a relationship, or is it just simply poor um, development of of bureaucratic structure that you would have an agency that is so conflicted? So I do think that if you were starting from scratch, you would not um, have an agency like the USDA with this internally conflicting mission. I think that is a a profound problem. Um, But I also think that this is not an – this may be a particularly egregious example, but it's not an isolated example. It's part of a widespread and systemic practice. Um, not just in the U.S., but in other countries, too, of governments and public health agencies getting together with industry to solve major public health problems, whether it be obesity or um, the opioid epidemic, for example, on the one hand, or cancer and climate change, to give you two other examples. Essentially, this has become the way 
we um, solve problems. And as I say in the book, it's become the water that policymakers have learned to swim in. They no longer see it anymore. And part of the challenge of the book is to try and get people to realize that this is problematic, irrespective of where you are in the political spectrum. Uh, you mentioned that it's an international problem. And um, let's talk about the United Nations. Um, um, uh they're um, they're uh, partnering uh, to deal with sustainability. Uh, they're partnering with Coca Cola when it comes to uh, to to uh, to India. Yeah, so they had an initiative. Um, the UN Habitat Program had an initiative called the Support My School Initiative, and the aims clearly. Um, are ones that most people would endorse. There's a problem with sanitation in schools in rural India. It's a gender equity issue. When there's poor sanitation, the girls drop out before the boys. So certainly you'd want to do something about improving sanitation. But they partnered with Coca-Cola in a, you know, a, a months and years long campaign with you know 12-hour telethons with the Coca-Cola logo emblazoned all over the place. I mean, you couldn't pay for that kind of advertising, or indeed it would cost you a lot more. And what Coca-Cola got in return for a relatively small investment um, was a lot of positive media coverage, burnishing the reputation of the company and promoting um, the sale of its products including um, its leading brands, which play a major role in um, uh, the obesity epidemic. And as I argue in the book, the UN program's mission is to promote sustainable living. But by promoting the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages made from scarce local water and sold in plastic bottles, that is neither sustainable from an environmental nor a public health point of view. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, industry, industry uh, partnership with, with research universities. I mean, give us an example of what, what is um, problematic with, with, with those relationships. So I think a lot of people get very anxious when they hear about um, the big high-profile partnerships involving Novartis or Monsanto, and there have been a number of those kinds of partnerships. But I think what they fail to recognize is that even smaller arrangements with lots of little different corporate actors can have a distorting effect on research that gets done. We know from a bunch of empirical studies that industry-funded or industry-sponsored research produces not only findings that are more favorable to the corporate sponsors, but also interpretations of those findings that are vastly more favorable to the corporate sponsors. But the additional point I make in the book is that we fail to recognize the ways in which these corporate partnerships and industry funding more broadly shapes the kinds of questions that get asked and answered, as well as how they get asked and answered. And if you take um, an example from the sort of uh, the cancer world, everybody benefits from doing lots of work on new cancer therapies that may add a few months to someone's life. And I would be the last to say we shouldn't do that research. But the kind of research that doesn't get done because of all these corporate partnerships or gets done to a far lesser degree are causes and prevention research because that kind of research would call into question the role of a huge number of corporations' products in cancer. So, for example, you see makeup companies sponsoring and supporting charities that do work on treatment and, and, so, and cure, but not on causes and prevention, because then you might have to ask the question, to what extent do makeup products contribute to cancer? So this is an important way in which um, uh, industry money works. It influences questions, and not surprisingly so. Corporations don't want scientists to look at questions that might hurt their bottom line. And, 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 it, and I mean, it influences questions not necessarily by um, by editorializing, but by simply just providing um, by uh, you know keeping people busy, right? I mean, it's yeah, just like there's there's only so many uh, questions you can ask, and if someone's paying you to ask the questions, uh, they may seem innocuous questions, but they're preventing you from examining other questions. 
Exactly right. They tend to crowd out the other questions. If you have if all this money floods in for you to look at questions that either promote the interests of industry or are not threatening to the interests of industry, those are the questions you'll explore and you'll neglect the other ones. But what I say in the book is if we're really serious about addressing problems like obesity, the opioid epidemic, like cancer or climate change, we have to be able to look at all potential solutions, including those that are threatening to the bottom line of powerful corporations. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that dynamic uh, just is reminiscent. I had a religious studies professor who was always like, look, you know, you can read any book you want about religion. Tell me what discipline the person comes from, and I will basically tell you what the book says, because their <laughs> primary question is going to start, is going to be different if they're a sociologist versus a psychiatrist, a psychologist or uh, you know, or a, uh, you know, uh, a political science person, they're all going to look at it from a different perspective. And in this instance, it's just money's perspective. So what, what I, since you talk about perspectives, what I really do want to emphasize is why people should care about this, irrespective of where they are in the political spectrum. Um, so I don't think corporate influence should be thought of as a partisan issue. I think everyone should care about it. And let me tell you why, right? We totally get that as between the branches of government, there should be some separation. We don't think it would be a great idea for the White House to sit down with the Supreme Court and figure out the next version of health care reform and the ways in which it, will, it could be made compatible with the Constitution. Why don't we think that's a good idea? Because the Supreme Court has to hold the other branches of government accountable and it has to interpret the Constitution and it, can't, it has to interpret the laws and determine their constitutionality. It can't do those things if it's in bed with the other branches of government making the laws or otherwise. So we totally get the importance of separation of powers, separations between um, branches of government. We also totally get the importance of separation as between private bodies, right? We don't think it would be a good idea for two major airlines to get together and one of them agree to take the New York DC route while the other takes the New York Boston route because we'd end up paying more because there'd be no competition. It's also why we think Price fixing is problematic. So we totally get the need for tension, struggle between the branches of government and tension or struggle among corporations for the market. So it, bearing in mind, we get the importance of public, public separation and private, private separation. Why is it that we think public and private getting together can solve our most pressing or wicked public health and environmental problems? And I argue that it can't and shouldn't. Uh, all right, uh, so let me play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Um, one being that there are actually political um, uh, ideologies that want to promote more corporate-friendly solutions. And, the, um, and, and you know, there, there are different, there are competing views on what antitrust should actually be. Um, you know, different schools of thought. In fact, that's starting to play out now in our politics as well. Um, the, uh, the, this, this concept of there being a conflict of interest there, it seems to me there's a significant percentage of the country that thinks that government at the very least, I mean, or at the most should be a conduit to creating more opportunities for corporate America. So a couple of things. First, um, my argument is not premised on the notion that government is inherently good and corporations are inherently bad. Both is equally capable of good or ill, as we know in this very moment. Um, and while I agree that there may be disagreements about the boundaries of antitrust, disagreements about um, to what extent governments should be supporting the work of corporations, governments are primarily the guarantors of the public good. And that, to me, is something I think which everyone should understand. After all, Republicans and Democrats alike breathe air, drink water, all those things we should be concerned about protecting. And um, corporations should complain about what regulators do, just as regulators should critique 
and regulate corporations' activities. That should, in an ideal world, be a, re- a relationship of tension and sometimes direct conflict. Conflict isn't inherently bad. Conflict between um, opposing sides in a legal case is what should give rise to a just result. Conflict between regulators and um, the regulated is what we should be aiming for. Uh, what do you say to someone who would say, well, OK, uh, it may be the case that, um, you know, uh, some uh, makeup company is, is funding the cancer research and therefore um, in a vacuum of, of corporations funding research about cancer, maybe maybe these uh, cancer researchers would ask questions that lead them to find that some of these corporations products are problematic. But that presumes that there's going to be money there like how do uh, what do we need to do uh, when when we hear about public private partnerships? Um, isn't the only way to ultimately um, get rid of this conflict of interest is to simply have uh, public financing for these uh, for these things? So I think public financing is really important. It, it's, it doesn't eliminate other concerns, right? So clearly one can have politicization. But yes, I would argue we need public funding. And what I would argue is before we can even have that conversation, what the leaders of public health agencies need to do and what the administrators of universities need to do, among others, is they need to stop touting these public-private partnerships with great celebration and then keeping their reservations quietly to themselves. We need to start having an open dialogue about why partnerships with industry and why corporate funding is problematic. And only once we've had that discussion can we get to the next stage of what are the solutions and is public funding part of a solution? And in my view, it is. Um, I think what what we're, what the situation we're in right now is one where we have this great public acclaim and all the celebration and the photographs and the holding the large blown up images of the checks of the corporate donation and then people going away and keeping their reservations to themselves. That, in my view, is the first thing that has to stop. Well, so how much of that do you think is going on, those like private resig- uh, re- reservations? I mean, I, I imagine maybe you bumped into that in the course of uh, of doing research for this book. And I'm curious, what do you think is the... I mean, l- let's explore that a little bit because that seems to me... Um, it's it, it it at that point it's not a question of persuasion right it's a question of something else yeah so so i i have a goal in the in the book and in my work more broadly and one goal is to help some people who don't see these relationships as tro- problematic to help some people understand why they are problematic the others who get that they're problematic but don't know quite how to articulate why, and my book is designed to help them articulate why. And then the third a third audience is those who know they're problematic but don't know where to go next. And one of the things I would say is there is an opportunity for collective action here. If you are the dean of a school of public health, why not get together with 10 other deans of a school of public health and write an open letter in the New York Times saying, look, you are relying on us, the academy, to provide solutions to problems like cancer cancer, opioids, and obesity. But if we're going to be able to help you, we have to be able to look everywhere at all potential solutions, not just those that serve the interests of industry. And we can't do that without public funding. That will be the first step. I look forward to reading such a letter in the New York Times next week. Well, and so, But then what happens? I mean, you still have this like sort of uh, financial dilemma, right? Like, where is the funding? Uh, aren't the, uh, the members of those, uh, the uh, alumni association of those schools going to come and say, okay, well, where are you getting the funding? So there are all sorts of potential models for funding. And, um, you know, one of them, you know, there, I'm not saying this is the only one or necessarily <laughs> the best one, but just off the top of my head, one possibility would be what if we um, created some method of assessing the role of a corporation's products in creating or exacerbating a public health crisis and tax them directly for that contribution to a public health crisis and use that money in order to fund research addressing the problem. That's one potential model. Another potential model is if corporations are going to require to garner a body of evidence in order to get FDA approval, for example, for their new drugs, is that they basically pay a a government body, an intermediary, a licensing fee, and that research gets farmed out to other, other bodies. 
other academic institutions. There are lots of different potential funding models. Some, uh, each has its pros and cons, but we will never get to that conversation until we start to talk about why what we have now is problematic. Um, do you see any, uh, uh, I guess, awareness uh, beyond the, the, that that is spoken in whispers, I guess, in sort of in the universities, um, how much? Uh, how much has the? I guess the environment changed in terms of how um, how aware people are of how uh, of how problematic this is, and I, and I, and this runs the gamut too, right? In terms of like even on some level like philanthropic stuff and um, and 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 just a broad. I mean, you mentioned the opioid crisis. The idea that the um, uh, that Purdue would sit down. Uh, would even be invited to the table at any point to talk about what to do with the opioid crisis is, um, I don't know, basically like inviting, um, you know, the 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 serial killer to to ask like, what's the best way to dispose of all these bodies or something. <laughs> Um, so the first thing I would say in response to your first question is, are people aware? Here's what people are aware of, because this gets featured in mainstream media, including the New York Times. They're aware that individual researchers are not fully disclosing their financial relationships with drug companies and other major corporations in some cases, because those are high-profile cases. People get named and shamed. What the general public is not aware of is the broader systemic problem that arises from institutional relationships, from relationships not just involving individuals and corporations, but institutions, um, but relationships at the institutional level, governments, universities creating partnerships. That's the first problem I think they're they're not aware of. And you're right, the opioid um, the opioid uh, situation I think is deeply deeply problematic. In 2017, when the NIH launched an initiative to address the opioid crisis, it pulled together a number of pharmaceutical companies, including Purdue. Purdue, by the way, had pleaded guilty in 2007 to um, misleading physicians and patients about the addiction risks of OxyContin. And according to recent filings by the Attorney General of Massachusetts, that, those practices continued for another decade. So while the NIH was sitting down and talking to Purdue, among other companies. And while Purdue was running advertisements in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times saying we are part of, we are going to be partners in the solution to the opioid crisis, <laughs> accord, at the same time as all that, according to the filings in, in the court in Massachusetts, they were, the company was also developing plans to expand the opioid market. So again, this is the model. Let's partner with corporations, so the model says, even though they may have had a role in creating or exacerbating the crisis. And so they're essentially, in some respects, being rewarded. But I just want to emphasize that the problem goes beyond one individual corporation like, Far like Purdue. If governments partner with pharmaceutical companies to solve the opioid crisis, then not surprisingly, the kind of solutions we're going to get are more opioids or more painkillers, more analgesics. Now, maybe indeed we do need more painkillers, but we cannot neglect the other potential solutions to the opioid crisis. And my fear is that that's what will happen if partnership with um, the pharmaceutical sector become the paradigm in that case too. So, uh, so broadly speaking, you cannot sit down and develop uh, or even ask questions about a problem with um, with entities that have, in some level, a a profit motive to ask specific questions rather than to go in and find the answers. And it seems that I guess the other important uh, message is. That even in certain circumstances, when there is a net positive with a specific company, overall, if you open yourself up to this dynamic, it's a net negative for society. Yeah. So the first thing is, can you sit down? Well, there are open fora for, the, for um, governments to interact with the private sector. Think of um, corporations giving evidence before Congress or responding publicly to regulations about how they'll impact their business. That kind of arm's length expression of views in a public forum is not nearly as problematic as these secret behind uh, closed doors partnerships. But as to your second point, 
Absolutely. It is a mistake to focus on individual. I can point to why a particular individual partnership is especially egregious. For example, using a soda company's logos, blazoning them all over the television screen and promoting its products. That's problematic. But it's a mistake to say, as many people say to me, show me an ideal partnership and we'll model that. Because the problem with thinking about partnerships in isolation is you miss the cumulative and systemic distorting effects of these kinds of relationships relationships as a paradigm for solving problems in public health. The Perils of Partnership, Industry, Influence, Institutional Integrity, and Public Health. Jonathan H. Marks, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. We will put a link to your book at majority.fm. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. All right, folks, there you have it. The data is in. Um, I hope people heard specifically that part about the um, uh, research that is paid for by corporations. Um, we get into this a lot with um, with all sorts of types of research. I don't want to bring it up and get all the emails, but um, the fact is, is that nobody. the The real problem is, it seems to me, and I think you know, uh, on a philosophical level, I think you know, to my perspective the professor might be a little bit more a um, little bit less jaded about the uh, the chances of convincing people of different ideologies of this dynamic i think you have to start with we got to provide funding in the same way that this money crowds out other questions you need to come in with money that crowds out this money <laughs> and uh and maybe you also need to sort of create regulations that inhibit, make this money less attractive, more restricted, uh, and then come in with with monies. I mean, and there are mechanisms in which to generate this. I mean, many of the drug patents that are developed, many uh, uh, all happen through public research and then end up getting privatized. So how about this? We... um, socialize the costs of developing these things. And instead of privatizing the profits, we socialize the profits and we throw those back into more research and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, there's the data, folks. So, Yeah, I thought it was super interesting when he was talking about um, taxing corporations for the cost that you can calculate of the social problems that they cause because it's uh, it's sort of an incremental position, right? Because... On the one hand, uh, if you have the political power to impose those kinds of taxes, it seems like you should use that to just, you know, get at the root of the problem and expropriate those corporations. On the other hand, it definitely (laughs) convinces people to think about it in a a new way than the way a lot of people think about it now, which is that there's, you know, no connection and no responsibility. There may be a slight difference between the political power in in causing companies to assume the responsibility for their externalities and and being able to expropriate them. But I think there's probably a little bit more of a leap in terms of the the political power that's involved in that. But the, the concept of making corporations pay for their externalities uh, we talk about all the time. I mean, the uh, if you factor in, never mind global warming, but the costs of um, of, of pollution to people's health, to uh, people's quality of life, to uh, potential for brain damage, for whatever it is, if you it, you know in selling products, in burning coal, in um, in, in in all of those factors. Um, these externalities would be uh, prohibitive to a lot of these businesses, frankly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the problem then becomes like, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. You know, you can't undo some of the damage that they do to people. Like you can't uh, bring back people from the dead who've died of opiate overdoses. Right. You can't, uh, you can't fix some of the damage that's been done to the environment, et cetera. All right. We're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. Uh, Just a reminder, folks, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, we give you extra content every day. And uh, also, we give you uh, the free show free of uh, commercials. 
and ads. Also, don't forget JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Not only is it great coffee, great company, uh, great cooperative company. Michael, today is Monday. That means, wait, what? Oh, yeah. Hey, how's it going? Weird. Uh, I'd stop by. <laughs> today is Monday. Obviously You're here. Obviously, don't get used to it. Um, and uh, you will be here definitely tomorrow. Definitely. What's happening tomorrow? What's happening tomorrow is John Idarola is making his debut on TMBS. Looking forward to talk with him of the Damage Report and the Young Turks. And then uh, Joshua Khan, who's a friend of show, who is the executive director of Wildfire Project and an activist who's worked everywhere from the Philippines to Arpaios, Arizona, is going to talk about the sort of ABCs of activism and uh, how we actually make change on a rent strike grassroots type of level. Seven o'clock, TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS for the whole thing. And check us out on our YouTube channel where we will live stream it and now have plenty of clips. Make change, okay? What'd you say? You said change. I know. I'm sorry. I, I have I have my throat is uh it's all right. You don't have to just bad. I mean I thought it was just like a hook. Um so yeah, that's how well, Limbaugh says it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes indeed, boo. Yes indeed, hiss. <laughs> that's what we're gonna be talking about with Joshua Khan. <laughs> Jamie. This week on the Drantifada, uh, we have an interview with Hamilton Nolan about labor organizing in the media and beyond. We are also releasing a bonus, I believe, today, wherein we talk about electoral politics with Hamilton Nolan. I know we don't do that very often, so you got to pay to hear us talk about that. And uh, I'm very excited to be releasing soon some interviews that Andy did with uh, people from the caravan that's currently in Tijuana to share their stories. Matt? Yeah, Literary Hangover folks, uh, subscribe to it on YouTube or on your uh, podcast feed. We're doing King Philip's War uh, this weekend, so look forward to that. Quick break, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Hey, That's I want to just thanks again to LifeLock Identity Theft Protection for supporting today's show. Of course, no one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. With LifeLock, you get identity theft protection and additional features to help protect your devices against cyber threats for as low as nine ninety nine a month. Don't waste another second. Visit LifeLock.com slash majority now to save 10% on your first year. That's LifeLock.com slash majority for 10% off. LifeLock.com slash majority.
personne ne lui a jamais appris. 